YouTube. Yeah, Facebook, uh, Facebook, YouTube, YouTube Live. How you doing? Okay. Testing, you ready? Testing. Uh, good evening, how's everybody doing? We now we call the meeting to order the redistricting symposium. Today is Monday, August uh, 30th, 2021, at time now 6.30 p.m. Uh, we'd like to welcome you at, to Bethel Number no. 1 Missionary Baptist Church. I will be doing a formal introduction uh, as we proceed in the program and a formal welcome. At this time, we'll have Dr. Sonny Bridges, the pastor of Bethel, Bethlehem Number no. 1 Missionary Baptist Church, to, to um, come up for the podium for invocation. Thank you, Councilor Bellman. Uh, before I pray, let me just give some instructions, if you don't mind, Cap. For the restrooms, for you to my right, uh, through, the, through the double doors here, ladies, the first door on the left, men's the second door on the left, if you decide to go to the restroom, okay? Let us bow our heads. Eternal God, our Father, we're grateful. We thank you for this time. We ask, oh God, for your leadership. We ask for your presence in the name of Jesus. Bless now your people. Lead us and guide us. We pray for the officials, the, those who you have put in leadership position. Give them the wisdom, the know-how, even as they lead your people. But we realize, oh God, without you we can do nothing. So we ask now, as we come together, that you open our minds up and that we uh, listen to you. And then not only that, God our Father, thank you for those that are here and those that are on their way. We pray in the name of Jesus that once again you touch each and every one of those, uh, our councilmen and others that's a part of this government official, that you do touch them and lead them and guide us as we come to listen to what you have for us tonight. For us in Jesus' name, we do pray and thank you. And all of God's children say amen, amen, and amen. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Bridges. Uh, the purpose of the meeting, and we'd like to welcome you to, again, to Bethlehem Missionary Baptist Church here in the Santa Ridge community of uh, Conway, South Carolina. The purpose of tonight's uh, forum is to provide information on the mechanics of redistricting, definitions for what is redistricting, reapportionment, the 2020 census, how it's related to to redistricting. So with that being said, we're going to move into what we what we decided to do is that just for just for the this for opening up communication, opening up dialogue with you, is that we have a couple of questions we'd like to share with you in regards to the history of uh, of Sand Ridge community. With that uh, we had door prizes, uh, $20 gift certificates, and if you, once you answer the question, raise your hand, we have a $20 gift certificate for you. So, uh, everybody's ready? Play a little uh, Sand Ridge Jeopardy for a second. Just to open up the communication, get a dialogue going with you right quick here. Uh, the first question is, a native of Sand Ridge community, the first black Horry County police officer, Name that gentleman. Who was that individual? Was the first black Horry County police officer from Sand Ridge community? All right, where's the hand? Where? Who's the first one to raise? Are we here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, then. Okay, native of uh, Sand Ridge community, uh, city of Conway, first black mayor. Who was raised first? Who was first?
Shay, next question. A native of Sand Ridge Community, entrepreneur, philanthropist, a grocery store owner, sponsored youth sport programs in the Sand Ridge Community, and the Sand Ridge Park is named in his honor. Name that individual. Yes, ma'am. The next one is for, let's go with, all right, this is, this, this is uh, we're we'll gonna move up to the national level in civil rights history and how it's related to, we're gonna relate that, connect the dots to re redistricting. U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 1857 that black people were not U.S. citizen, named the case. Name the case. Right there, okay. 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 The first federal law to affirm that all U.S. citizens are equally pr protected under the law. Name the law. Okay. Anyone? Okay. The answer is Civil Rights Act of 1866. Okay. All right. Next one. In 1896, U.S. Supreme Court established the legality of racial segregation so long as facilities were kept separate but equal. Name the case. Okay. Okay, here. Okay, here, okay, 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 all right then. All right, now, this is the easy one. Everybody, I see, I see 100% hands on this one. What year was the, the Voting Rights Act passed? The Voting Rights Act, Act passed, what year was that? Yes, sir. Okay, all right, okay. Okay, okay, all right, one more question, okay? All right, uh, we'll give you one, okay. Name the first black U.S. Congress member from, he was from Georgetown, South Carolina, the first U.S. Congress member from Georgetown, South Carolina. What was his name? From Georgetown. Let's 
see, okay. In, in, uh, in the case in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, everybody know that famous case. What was the first case? It was tried in South Carolina. What was the first case? What was the first case? Clarendon County. Clarendon County. Clarendon County. Clarendon County. Anyone, anyone? Briggs versus Elliott. It was the first case. Brown versus Brown v. Uh, Board of Education was not the first case. Okay. All right. So uh, we had a little fun there. Okay. I like to thank our thank our sponsors for that. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, let's go up here. Okay. 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 Let's check that one. Okay, uh, at this time we'd like to bring up, we didn't have anybody here, just give it a quick. At this time we'd like to introduce our guest speaker tonight. His name is Marion Foxworth III. I'd like to bring him up. Yes, sir. Mr. Foxworth, come on up. Okay. I'm shorty. Um, thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Bellamy asked me to be here tonight to speak a little bit about redistricting, reapportionment, um, how we go about doing it and for what reasons. And uh, hopefully I can lay that out um, in a way you can understand, uh, not that you have to or maybe even should listen to what I have to say. By way of introduction, I am the Register of Deeds for Horry County, a job I've had for six years. Prior to that, I was on county council for 13 years. And uh, I taught government at Horry Georgetown Tech for six years, uh, American government, constitutional law, civil rights, civil liberties, things like that. And 10 years ago, when I was on council, council was uh, charged, as we are every 10 years, with redistricting. I chaired the ad hoc committee of Horry County Council, and we uh, produced a map that I was kind of proud of because it was the first time in our history that we did it cleanly, for lack of a better word, not at the point or threat of a federal lawsuit, not at the order of the Department of Justice, not at the losing end of a federal trial that was held like the three previous attempts had made. We did it uh, 10 years ago, and we were able to do it and get a unanimous consent out of council. Um, we... Uh, sent it off to the Department of Justice for pre-clearance and got our response back in 45 days, which is kind of unheard of. We ended up not getting sued, and in the 10 years that uh, the plan has been in place, we have not had a contested election overturned, which is something that occurred in the plan that was adopted in 2000 and the one adopted in 2010. Oh, 1990. So both of those situations resulted in having to redo elections because that's what this is all about. Um, by way of explaining the process, if you will, first of all, this is not new. This is something that has been around since the framers drafted and adopted the Constitution in 1787. In the Constitution, it says that every 10 years, every year ending in a zero, basically, the United States will conduct a census, and based on that census, we apply it to our government in different ways, different shapes, different patterns. You'll remember from your history classes that the fight over how we go about 
creating this government was intense. And there were a lot of negotiations and a lot of, uh, a lot of um, concessions, ways to get around uh, obstacles. One of them, actually now they're crediting a South Carolinian, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney with, was the creation of a bicameral legislature. What does that mean? That means two houses of Congress. We have a Senate and we have a House of Representatives. And we get them two entirely different ways. The Senate treats every state in the Union exactly the same. Every state gets two U.S. Senators. California has 38 million people. They have two U.S. Senators. Wyoming has barely over a half a million. They have two U.S. Senators. Tiny little Rhode Island is smaller geographically than Horry County has two U.S. Senators, and Alaska, which is five times the size of Texas, has two U.S. Senators. The compromise to create that, to treat all the states the same, which was a concession to small states, kind of like South Carolina, but specifically Rhode Island and the smaller states. They had just as much clout and influence as the big populous states. The trade-off from that was the creation of the lower house, or the House of Representatives, where membership was based on population. And members of the House of Representatives were assigned to each state based on the population of that state at the time. And every 10 years, every year ending in zero, we count everybody and we go back and we look and we apportion or reapportion those members in the House to the states based on how many they would receive because of their population. Um, the Constitution calls for the reapportionment to occur on a national level, but then the, the follow-up process called redistricting will occur at the state level. It's up to the individual states to then take the number of House members they were given and to draw the districts from which they will be elected. Now, why is this important? Well, for a lot of reasons. Congressmen, elected congressmen, if they serve time, get in powerful position, they can bring home a lot of bacon. They can make life better for people in their district. And the more congressmen you have, the bigger your congressional district, your congressional delegation. What does that equate to? You remember during every presidential election, they talk about the electoral college. The number of votes every state has is equal to the number in their congressional delegation. That means the number of House members they have plus two senators. South Carolina has seven congressional seats based on our population. Um, what was that, 2010? We qualified for a seventh congressional seat. We have two senators. Our electoral college vote is nine. In a state like California, where they have about 58 congressional districts and two senators, their electoral vote is much higher. But there are, I think, 11 states that in some cases don't qualify for a single congressman. Now, we passed a law several years ago that says every state will get at least one. So there are 11 states whose electoral vote count is three. They have one congressman and two senators. They actually have a bigger Senate delegation than their House delegation. 
the Constitution is very quiet on what kind of criteria is to be used in drawing these districts. And for most of our history, politicians at the state level were pretty well left to their own device to draw them any way they saw fit. Over the course of the last 50 to 60, 70 years, more and more laws have been passed at the national level. Sometimes more important is more and more cases have been tried in the courts and the Supreme Court has issued an opinion dealing with this issue. And that has formed the basis of why we're here today. Because not only are we talking about the House of Representatives on the national level, which we've been doing since 1790, in the 1970s, the state of South Carolina, in trying to get away from some of the electoral discrimination that occurred in this state, went to single member districts for the House of Representatives on the state level. Now for another 15 years, they maintained an electoral method specifically designed to keep African Americans from being elected. And it worked. There weren't any. It called for the creation of senatorial districts. In our case, we were lumped with three other counties. And if you wanted to run for and get elected to the state senate, you had to run in all four counties. And you had to win in all four counties. Well, what that did, because of the population base in Horry County, is completely diluted African American voting uh, modules from place to place. And that stayed in place until a federal lawsuit was brought in 1984 that forced single member districts for the state senate for the first time. And uh, in addition to that, here at the local level, the county council, under threat of a federal lawsuit in 1980, agreed with the delegation to accept single member districts. And uh, since that time, they have been elected from single member districts. That happened after we had an election. I think it was nine at-large seats countywide. 56 people ran. After the runoffs were over, we elected nine people all of them white males, one from Ainer, one from North Myrtle Beach, and seven from Conway. A uh, lawsuit was immediately threatened by the Conway branch of the NAACP, Reverend Rufus Daniels, who some of you might remember from uh, Cherry Hill. And the end result was the county agreed to single member districts. Some 16 years later, the Horry County School Board followed suit. They were elected at large, and uh, I think it was 1996 is when they agreed to single member districts. Now, a Supreme Court decision was handed down in 1964. Name of the case was Westbury versus Saunders. And one of the tricks the drawers used was finally put to bed. And that was, remember I told you they were kind of left to their own devices, how to draw it? There was no, nothing on the books, nothing in the Constitution that said that they had to be equal. You could have a district over here made up of 50,000 people and a district over here made up of five. And it took a Supreme Court decision to change that in Westbury versus Saunders in 1964. A couple of years later, the Supreme Court applied that ruling to state and local government. And that's where we get the one man, one vote principle that says every district should be equal in population 
such that everybody has equal access to that elected official. Everyone's representing the same number of people. Now, as I just explained, that doesn't happen in the U.S. Senate. But everything from the U.S. Senate down to city council, it does. Now, in 1982, a change was made to the Voting Rights Act that made the 1984 decision on the state Senate possible. That change went about, and it was meant to address systems that were put in place with the intent to discriminate. Between 1965 and 1982, uh, the Voting Rights Act was in place and it banned discrimination based on race. Um, but how do you determine that the intent was to discriminate. The defense back in the day was, well, yeah, we realize there's no blacks elected, but we can't help that. That's just the way people vote. It wasn't our intent to discriminate. Never mind the electoral system itself was designed in such a manner to preclude that very thing from happening. And the Congress of the United States passed an amendment to the Voting Rights Act that did away with the requirement to have to prove intent. If you could prove that the end result, if what you ended up with was discriminatory, regardless of what the intent was to get there, then it was illegal. There are a number of Supreme Court decisions. There are a number of um, state laws, state constitution, U.S. Constitution, U.S. laws, state Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court that have set up where we are today where we have a whole bunch of criteria that we kind of have to look at when we do this process to make sure we're not setting ourselves up to be challenged. It's much more I'd say complicated in some ways because you've got so many layers of different districts you have to deal with. A lot of the electoral, uh, a, a lot of the discriminatory electoral methods were done away with. They were sued and they were unpended. Not all of them. We've still got them right here. Two largest municipalities in the state that don't have single member districts right here in Horry County. There are types of discrimination beyond racial, economic. A big one we face here now is um, geographic discrimination. If you can vest all the power and influence in one small neighborhood, doesn't really matter black or white, you know, that, that's kind of an afterthought. The equitable distribution of governmental goods and services doesn't happen. If your neighborhood doesn't have sidewalks or your neighborhood has sorry uh, streets with holes in them, doesn't really matter if you're black or white. That's come about because of geographic discrimination that does not equitably distribute governmental goods and services. However, in spite of all those Supreme Court decisions, there are a number of things that it is perfectly legal and in some cases encouraged in terms of discrimination. Racial is not one of them. That one has been addressed in the Voting Rights Act. Now the enforcement provision of the Voting Rights Act was struck down seven years ago. So even if there is a violation, it's somewhat questionable how it's going to be adjudicated or enforced because the enforcement provision from the Department of Justice is no longer there. The Supreme Court decision last month, written by Supreme Court Alito, struck down that intent clause that I was just talking about. That's not on the books anymore. 
So it's becoming more and more difficult to force some of the gains we have made in the last 40, 50, 60 years. Some of those assurances are not necessarily there, or even if the assurance is there in terms of a valid standing Supreme Court decision, how do you enforce it? It can be very problematic. And we have seen um, nationally the partisan rancor that, that's real crazy right now. We have seen one party admit that they will use gerrymandering to try to capture one of the houses. Um, they have named five or six states where they hope to utilize their control of the state legislature to do that. Um, that's a little bit outside of the norm, but it's not illegal. They can do that legally. And it could wreak havoc with what we think of as our seven districts right now. Um, the state legislature is responsible for drawing lines for Congress, for the state Senate, and the state House. Generally speaking, the House draws their own lines, the Senate draws their own lines. The big fight is over the congressional seats. At the local level, county council is responsible for redrawing their own lines. Now, we talked about the founding fathers and the two senators per state. As we grew, as we admitted states into the union, the Senate was easy. We just added two more seats. To the point now we have 50 states. Here's the math part. How many senators we got? Two per state, 50 states. 100 senators, right? The House is a little more complicated. That number is nowhere in the Constitution. It's up to Congress to set that number. And much like the Senate, for the first 100 years of our existence, when they admitted a state, they would just add more seats to the House as well. And a couple of times they toned it back, uh, but generally they were adding. Up until 1910, 1910 was a watershed year in that it, they changed the powers of the Speaker of the House, and they also limited by law the number of members of the House to 435. So now for 110 years, that number has been static, 435. It doesn't change. So the reapportionment and the subsequent redistricting is a zero-sum game. South Carolina gained a seat last time around, the 7th District. In order for South Carolina to gain one, if the total number doesn't change, that means somewhere else has got to lose one. You lose not only that congressman or congress lady, you lose the cloud of that office, you lose that vote in the Electoral College. For 40 years, right before and right after the turn of the 20th century, you had a huge migration of people from down south, up north, to work in the factories. You saw southern states lose representation. South Carolina at one time had 13 congressmen. And we lost down to, I think, six was our bottom, five or six. Now we're back to seven. What you're seeing now is a reversal of those trends of the 1920s, and that is a migration from the Midwest where all the Rust Belt jobs have gone away and the Northeast where the aging baby boomers are tired of digging snow and where are they coming? They're moving south, they're moving southwest and the last several census uh, that we have taken northeastern midwestern states have lost representation the South and Southwest had picked up. And that continued in this census, even though there was quite a bit of undercount. That same trend continued. And it will continue. 
Now, in terms of racial makeup for districts, that is working against the African American community. And it's strictly a mathematics game. Our population in Horry County went up a little less than 100,000. An inordinate number of those are not only na not native South Carolinians or Horry County folk, they're mostly white. And everyone that moves in slightly changes the overall demographic breakdown of Horry County. So over the last 30 years, the percentage of African Americans has dropped as population has grown. We do have African Americans moving in, but the percentage is much higher for Caucasians. Now, that is probably going to continue. Another problem in drawing what the 82 amendment to the Voting Rights Act encouraged, which was uh, what are called majority minority districts. Districts that are drawn in such a fashion that a minority community makes up the majority of that district. Guaranteeing that a minority community can elect somebody. The 82 Amendment to the Voting Rights Act encouraged that and happened here in South Carolina as well. The Legislative Black Caucus worked to increase the number of members in majority minority districts, but in the process bleached a lot of the other districts, which kind of upset the apple cart in terms of who controlled the House and where the real power was. Same thing can and does occur in a reciprocal fashion. Um, the prevailing Supreme Court case came out of North Carolina in 2001. The name of the case was Hunt versus Cromartie. You probably remember Jim Hunt was the governor of North Carolina. That the case was named for him. They drew a map in an effort to create as many majority minority districts as possible. And one of the districts they created was the 12th congressional district in North Carolina. It was called the Interstate District. It went from the Virginia line all the way down to the suburbs of Charlotte. And the only thing it had in common was the interstate. I can't remember if it was 95 or 85. Ran right through the middle of it. And someone brought a lawsuit, and it went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the prevailing case, the prevailing language for how much import you can put on race came from that case. It says that race can be a determining criteria but it cannot be the only and cannot be the predominant criteria. There are a number of other things you have to take into consideration. Today, the Horry County Council Ad Hoc Committee on Redistricting met and adopted, and it will go to full council, I think, in a week or two, a list of goals, objectives, and criteria for how to bring about this um, redistricting plan. And the criteria they adopted references that very uh, phrase. It pledges to use all the existing laws, the Voting Rights Act, uh, one man, one vote principle, historical communities. Basically, this set of goals and objectives would accomplish redistricting for county council and the school board in the same fashion that was legally before us for not only 10 years ago, but even before then, which made me kind of relax a little bit because we didn't really know if they are going to throw the rule book out and you know start all over. But with the districts drawn the way they were and the new census figures, um, 
and the belief in following that list of goals and objectives, we can probably come about a really good redistricting plan that uh, keeps, in, keeps in place governing principles. I mentioned the 12th congressional district in North Carolina, the prevailing Supreme Court decision. Supreme Court threw that out. They said that was an illegal drawing and pandering to the African American community, basically because people at the Virginia line had very little in common with people in the suburbs of, of Charlotte. That case was used just a few months after it was handed down in a case coming out of Horry County. In 2000, council adopted a redistricting plan that attempted to maximize African-American voting uh, potential and potential to elect someone. 20, 30 years before then, there were the percentage of African-Americans allowed for two majority minority districts. Over the years, the ability to do that went down because of, as I mentioned, in migration and integration. As black and African American folks decided to move out of traditional neighborhoods and into more segregated and white neighborhoods, it became harder and harder to draw a district where you get them all together. It's kind of hard to do if you stop and think about it. You know, the goal is integration, but the end goal of integration is to make it virtually impossible to draw a majority minority district. Between in migration and integration, 20 years ago, it became impossible to draw any majority minority districts. But in 2000, they attempted to keep those percentages as high as possible. And one of the districts they ended up with went from downtown Myrtle Beach to the west side of Loris. Think about that for a minute. What does someone on the west side of Loris have in common with somebody in downtown Myrtle Beach other than their complexion? And the Supreme Court or the uh, federal courts threw that plan out because the council had overreached in trying to accomplish what they thought was a noble objective. The courts ruled that they had overreached and had created an illegal district. And it created a whole new plan that was put in place in, I think, the spring of 02. That was actually the plan I was elected under in June of 02. So sometimes you can go too far in trying to reach noble objectives. I like to tell people when we talk about redistricting, it's an algebraic equation because what you do is you take the total population and you divide it by the number of districts. Take the total population of the United States, divide by 435, and that's going to be what your target number is for a congressional district. Same with state senate, state house, same with county council. I think in the current census count, the new districts will be 31,000, 911 or something like that, something like that. So the ad hoc committee will attempt to draw new districts reaching towards that numerical magic number that follows all of these guidelines, meets political approval, and doesn't break any laws. Because that algebraic equation, that's simple. Total population divided by the number of districts, that's your target number. Superimpose that on top of the jigsaw puzzle. Because there are a number of existing laws and Supreme Court decisions that come into play. One is contin um, contiguousness. You can't draw a district 
that has basically two parts. You can't draw a big district here and then a little satellite part of it completely detached. It has to be contiguous. And that includes natural boundaries. You couldn't create a congressional district in, in um, Arizona with half of it on one side of the Grand Canyon and the other half on the other because there's no way to access one side of the district from the other. You think, well, we don't have a Grand Canyon. We got the Waccamaw River. And south of Conway, there's no bridge. So if you grew District 7, Councilman uh, Bellamy's district, eastward across the river in order to get from the traditional part of his district to the eastern part, you'd have to leave District 7, traverse through two or three other districts, and then go back into District 7 you're asking to get sued with something like that. We dodged a bullet. Another one of the criteria is pre-existing political subdivisions, communities of interest, historical communities. Uh, we had a plan in place for 20 years that divided tiny little Atlantic Beach into two districts in an effort to dilute their voting strength. We didn't get sued over it, but we dodged a bullet there. Very easily could have and probably would have overturned the plan. You're never going to have a perfect plan. You're never going to have one that checks every box, but you try to get as much of it as you can and create a fair system with a logical reason for why you draw it that way that you can defend in court and give a reason for why you did what you did. And that's all we can do. That's the process. It uh, hopefully will be over by um, the new year, January, February. Because now, since the enforcement mechanism of the Voting Rights Act is no longer in place, one of the things that doesn't exist anymore is pre-clearance by the Justice Department. So when county council adopts their plan, basically the voter registration office can start making their changes. It does not have to go before Washington anymore. That was one of the things that happened with the striking down of Section 7 of the Voting Rights Act. And the, the logic there was, was solid. Their logic was it's an unconstitutional law because it doesn't apply to everybody. And it doesn't. It only applied to 13 states. It still only applies to 13 states. And a few Native American um, tribal grounds out west have been added. Uh, but it, it never applied to the entire country. I hope that answers some of the questions you may have. I'll be glad to answer any that I might have sparked or I didn't answer or didn't touch on. I know it kind of sounds like a college lecture. I apologize. I try to keep it as uh, truthful and to the point as I can and explain why these things happen the way they do. Any questions? Well, look at here. Uh -huh. Gerrymandering, okay. I told you that this process goes back to 1790, the first reapportionment. Not too long after that, politicians started trying to push the envelope. And a politician in a uh, governor in Massachusetts named Eldridge Jerry drew a reapportionment plan for Congress, and he tried to carve in all his buddies and and do it just like he wanted. And when he finished drawing it, on a map, it looked like a salamander. And uh, uh, editorial cartoonist drew that as an editorial cartoon and coined the term gerrymander from the name Elders Jerry and a salamander. 
And what it refers to is drawing district lines in a way that would benefit somebody for some purpose, whether it be political, geography, economic, racial. And like I explained earlier, according to the law, some of those are perfectly legal. It is legal to draw districts in a way that favors one party over another. It is legal to draw districts in a way that can discriminate against geography. We see that in two places in the city now, uh, in the county now. So it, gerrymandering has been around, I think that occurred in 1811. So this is a problem, as you can see, that's been around for 200 plus years. It's not something new. Beginning in the late 50s, Congress and the courts tried to standardize it and apply equity and equality as best they could, in some cases having to do with race, and other cases like one man, one vote, didn't really have anything to do with race. It was just a fair and equitable thing to do. Communities of uh, uh, interest, historical communities, pre-existing political subdivisions, things like that. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. You, that's okay. That's okay. But I want you to bring it home to us. Make it uh, where someone who has no knowledge not, um, will understand that they need to be at the meeting and they need to be at the table and um, and they need to know how these committees are formed. Um, Orie County has already selected a redistricting community uh, committee. And from my understanding, um, Councilman Bellamy is on that committee, correct? And Mrs. Joyce Hickman is on that committee. But prior to their nominate being on the committee, there was nobody on that committee that looked like us. Okay, let me just answer your question, okay? Okay. Answer, and how that second. committee got formed. Okay. To answer your, your question about the redistricting committee, ad hoc committee, okay, uh, the committee was formed, uh, the chairman, Johnny uh, Gardner, has the authority to appoint the redistricting ad hoc committee. Initially, he appointed Tyler Servant as the chairman, and Al Allen and Ken Richardson was appointed as uh, members of the committee, right? And reason why he did not appoint me to committee, because I serve on four committees, okay? I chair two committees, okay? So, well, and I received, what happened was that uh, Thursday night, we were doing uh, Friday morning, at, I had to be at Bucksport at 8 a.m. in the morning for the uh, vaccination and also COVID-19 testing and health screening. Okay, so I was on the phone back and forth uh, communicate and make sure everything was in place, ready to go for that. So uh, I received an email at nine. I came back and checked my email about nine thirty in the morning. The county and there were several emails that weren't why you not were you, were you not appointed to the committee. I explained to them that our I serve I serve on four committees. I'm the chairman of two. So 
I would say, well, we'll give somebody else the opportunity to serve. So I kept receiving other emails, phone calls. I said, okay, I'll serve. So I contact the, uh, the chairman. We discussed it, and I explained to the chairman, because uh, I, had I hadn't, hadn't had time to review the list myself, because I just saw, I received an email about 4 p.m. I saw a flash of names, and that was it, and I was back working on, uh, on the, the Bucksport uh, uh, event we had. So what I did was that I, I talked to the chairman, and I agreed with the comments that the committee should be reflective of the population demographics of Orie County. And he agreed to that, okay? He said, Orton, uh, we, yes, you're correct. So within 40, I think it was, I started making phone calls, called around. So that was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, we had that, we had uh, Ms. Ms. Hickman, she agreed to serve. So and now we have uh, three primary members who are white and two African Americans. And I agree, I agree with the comments that were received. That is correct. But the, the committee should have been, which is now, we corrected it. we taken corrective action. And it, it, the committee is reflective of, but when, uh, it's reflective of the population of Orie County. Right. Orie County has 350,000 uh, people that live in Orie County. African Americans, we only represent 13%. It's about approximately 45,500 African Americans that live in Orie County. And your and your comments are correct, and we we did make take corrective action. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Just to follow up on that, this process has not been static. It's a moving target in a lot of ways, and we try to learn from where, what we did before and what we didn't do well. Um, this is the first time in that I know of that anyone outside of council itself sat on the committee. This time they made an effort to include the school board. Uh, last time around they were not at the table. And um, to answer your question when you first started, where did this committee come from? That kind of depends on what level of government you're asking about. Because like I, I said, when it comes to congressional districts, which I think we're, that, that's a scary one, and state senate and state house, that is done completely in Columbia in committee rooms and you don't see or hear much about that. The county this time has not only brought the school board to the table, but com people from within the community like Ms. Hickman, um, and uh, the end result is they're more inclusive than you're going to find elsewhere. And it's a moving target we try to improve. One of the things we did not take into consideration 10 years ago that we specifically included in that list of goals and criteria, for instance, is attendance zones for the school boards. That's something you would think would make a lot of sense to at least consider. But 10 years ago, I can tell you, because I chaired the committee, we, it didn't even come up. So we try to improve. And at least based on where we were 10 years ago and the list of criteria and guidelines that the committee itself adopted today, along with the timeline, there's going to be much more and ample opportunity for input. What was passed today will go before full council on September 7th, and the chairman, I believe, is going to call for, uh, he had mentioned calling a public hearing as part of that, yeah. adoption yeah. by resolution. Is that the, one on the, the seventh. The seventh. Again, when the maps are proposed, the ad hoc committee itself has scheduled public hearings. And there will be a public hearing, formal public hearing, at full council when council sees the maps. So there's probably more opportunity, and I understand where you're coming from, but you might be aiming at the wrong level is what I'm, I'm trying to say. I'm not aiming at the wrong level. Are you the oldest person? Sure. I'm trying to learn and understand it. That's so Join that's the club. purpose. Um, you used the word noble objectives by several times and 
while you were speaking. So are you aware of any noble objectives by the redistricting committee or our city councilors or anybody who's in, in, um, in those positions regarding redistricting? As far as the county and school board? Yeah. Well, again, they adopted today. What was the adoption for today? They adopted a um, list of goals and objectives and criteria. Is that made public? Yeah, yeah it, it will is. be. I don't know if it's out there yet, but it will be. It actually is the, they adopted it today, and that's what will go to full council okay. on September 7th, and that's when there will be a public hearing, and you'll have an opportunity to speak on that. Okay, I got one more question, then I'll allow someone else to speak. On September the 9th, at um, Point Starlington Tech at the Grand Strand Conference Center. Can you tell me what that meeting is about? No, ma'am, I don't know anything about it. Okay. Do you know who's sponsoring? September. It's a House yeah. panel. See, the, the, the House and the Senate will do the same thing the County Council did. They will appoint an ad hoc committee specifically to deal with redistricting. And... Uh, I think the Senate had, what they do is they travel around, their effort to take input is to travel around the state and conduct public hearings. I think the Senate was here, about, and they, so this would be the House's version of that to take input. Mickey? On the ad hoc committee, um, is it how many people on the ad hoc committee again? How many people? Five, Orton. And how many how many Democrats on there? Because you got Republicans One. and Democrats. I mean, it makes a difference when you got the bunch of Republicans. One. You should have some Democrats on there too that make up the, the conscience of, of this whole this whole area because you got a lot of blacks. It's, it's I, I think that was the rationale behind Doris Hickman as former party chairman. But the other four members um, are of the other party. Um, keep in mind that when you talk about county council, we don't have any on council. Democrats. I was the last Democrat elected in a general election east of the Waccamaw River. Yes, sir. Professor Foster, uh, uh, I want to get some clarification on something. You said earlier that uh, the black population in Orange County has been decreased. Uh, By percentage. By percentage, okay, okay. Can you further clarify that? Because it, is it due to the number of uh, mostly white people coming down from uh, the north? And the in migration. Most of them are Caucasian, and uh, even though there are some African Americans retiring here too and moving here to work, on a percentage base, the overwhelming majority is not. And when you add that to what was here, as the number goes up, the African American, even though their number is rising, it's not rising as fast. And that causes the overall percentage to actually shrink. That's why it's impossible now to draw a county council or school board district that uh, would be majority minority. You can't do it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You said that the process was totally legal. Totally what? Well, some, some parts of gerrymandering can be legal. If it's done with the intent of doing it to uh, disenfranchise a minority community, then that is illegal. But you now, because of the last Supreme Court decision, will have to prove not only that it happened, but the intent was to make that happen. It's, it's a harder legal uh, hurdle to reach, if you will. Voters. 
Is there any other besides the United States? I don't know that I can answer that question. Um, there are a number of electoral methods around the world based on a whole lot of different criteria. And uh, we're somewhat unique because when in 65, African Americans in large number were granted the right to vote, particularly down south, in large part they were kept in segregated parts. So it was easy to draw a district once it became, um, I guess I'd say legal to do it, to draw a district that would be a high number percentage-wise of African Americans. As that has decreased, as integration has occurred, that's become harder and harder to do as well. You don't have a, you don't have a red line district anymore. That's illegal to keep blacks in a specific area. And with that being said, be, because the, the party that's in power get to draw those lines, how, isn't that a, a cycle, a never ending cycle because they also draw their own electoral base that keeps them in power? Yes, and that's legal. Uh, plain and simple, in the eyes of the Supreme Court, law of the land, and that has stayed the same regardless of which party has controlled the White House, the Senate, the House, or all three at one time, like the Democrats last did. Uh, well, they do right now, but it's a slim margin. But they did it in uh, 2008 for 18 months. And uh, rather than readdressing the Voting Rights Act, we were more concerned at that time on health care. And uh, we missed some golden opportunities. Voting rights, in a lot of ways, have been under attack for a long time. Um, and where we are now is a long-term chipping away at where we had gotten to. We spent, uh, when, when you take into consideration the progressive era, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights, everything else, we spent a better part of 200 years going from a very close first elections in late 17, early 1800s, less than 8% of the population was eligible to vote. Think about that, 8%. And since that time, in the early 1800s, we have taken steps to extend the franchise, it's called, to grow the footprint of democracy and bring more and more people into the fold as voters. My grandmother was 34 years old before she could legally vote. Women did not get a right to vote in this country until 1920. African American men had the right to vote before women. We have taken steps from the very beginning. Uh, when 8% of our population had the right to vote, you had to be free, white, 21, male, own property, and in nine of the 13 states, you had to belong to a specific church. You had a state-sponsored religion. If you didn't belong to the right church, you couldn't vote. The first effort to extend that was, no, I'm not going to dance around this, was trying to get as many white men eligible to vote as possible. And for the next 50, 60 years, that was an effort. The religious requirement went away. The requirement to own property went away. So by about 1828, you had about 30% of the population. 1865, black men get the right to vote. And in a lot of the states, they kept it. 
In the southern states, they kept it until 1895 when Plessy versus Ferguson took away, and the Jim Crow laws, the Black Code, took that right away. Black women didn't have that right even then. In 65, you get, or 1920, women get a right to vote. Uh, 65, African Americans with the Voting Rights Act, men and women finally are extended the right to vote. Then in 1971, 18 year olds get the right to vote. So every time we have extended that right to a larger portion of the population to bring them into the fold, what you find if you go back and look in history is it takes a long time for that segment of the population to even participate. Women just reached men in terms of their turnout percentage two election cycles ago. African Americans still vote about eight to 10 percentage points behind uh, white Americans when it comes to voting. And Latinos are 25 points behind African Americans. Most elections are won or lost, not based on who votes, but on who doesn't vote. If you get a turnout in a presidential, which is our highest turnout of any elections we have, more people vote in November of a presidential election year than any other time. If you hit 60% of those eligible to vote, vote, that's considered a high turnout election. And here's the sad part. Of the people that could vote, a lot of them aren't even registered. When we talk about eligible voters, that's the people that have bothered to register. So you got another whole segment of the population doesn't even bother to register. You don't have to look around far. You ask about other Western democracies. You don't have to look far to see countries that vote in much, much higher turnout percentage than we do. I'm sorry. Yes, some states, and, and again, this is the whole Tenth Amendment uh, separation of powers between the federal government, state governments. How that is done is left up to the individual states. And a number of states have gone to a nonpartisan committee or commission to actually draw the lines. Now that's for Congress and state legislature whether or not that travels down to county council or school board, I don't know. But there are a number of states where the politicians have tried to get out of the process. I don't remember exactly how many states, but it's less than two dozen, less than half of them. And it's one of those kind of like Saddam Hussein. Once you get in power, it's hard to give it up. And, uh, I could cite you all kind of examples of that. Anybody else? Cedric? I thank you for your speech. I had to listen online pretty much, so <laughs> cheating on another meeting. <laughs> but I think my question is more so to Councilman Bellamy about the symposium this evening. How is this going to affect change with the Ori County Redistricting Committee? I know Mr. Foxworth, you are on there by virtue of your position as Register of Deeds, but for I'm all not, of us I'm together- I'm not on the ad hoc committee, I'm just staff. Well, right, that's what, yeah, that, that's what, by virtue of there, you're there. But how is being here tonight, brave in COVID, when most of us had been in a building, gonna affect change when we leave here. Because if we know that only about 50% of Ori County, somewhere there did their census, 
So the, how to draw these maps is based upon census data is a major part, am I right? Census data now? I want to know to first, I guess it'd be double, uh, it's a two part question. Okay. How being here tonight going to affect change with the Ori County redistricting ad hoc committee? How's it this being here tonight? We heard all these fancy sayings and all of this stuff, but how is being here going to affect change in Ori County? And then based upon the census data, only about 50% of Ori County completed their census. Well, so what, what data are you referring to? Uh, because one thing we can go on is what, what's provided by the U.S. Senate, U.S. Census. Today we had a uh, the redistricting committee meeting, and I will share with the numbers that we have to work with. In Ore County, the numbers we provided by the U.S. Census was 351,029. Those are the numbers, official numbers that we have to work with and we have 11 districts. Now, if you have some other data, please share that with us, and we will communicate that with the U.S. Census. Let me say this, and I've said it before, it's like a broken record if you've been at any other meeting. We did this in 2010. We did this with the county, we did it with the with state, and I thank Mr. Foxworth for enlightening on that. This is the first time that others have been brought to the table and it's only one additional person, and her folk is very, will be very weak in that committee, which I wish they didn't have a partisan committee. We, we're pushing for an independent commission um, with a citizen's initiative to elect those persons to the redistricting committee. So what you're saying tonight is basically a done deal. We should have had this meeting before the census was completed. This symposium would have been better to get people to do their census work and then 10 years ago to work on this project because it's basically a done deal. What, what's a, what is a lines, done deal? No, 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 no. You, you gave the data. You're drawing lines based upon 300 and some thousand people. Right. Well, then that's, those lines will not benefit what we're talking in here tonight. And then the, this U.S., I mean, State House and State Senate is pushing communities of interest. And if you're talking about communities of interest, we saw that as a negative effect here in Ori County in 2010. You, this county, this state diluted the black vote. It didn't give a chance of a, of a minority being elected here in this state. And I'm going to say this, and I, I don't want anybody to be offended, but look at your committee today. You still didn't appoint a white woman, and we still fight for white women. Black folks fight for everybody. You appointed a black woman, but you still don't have a white woman on the committee. So you can't say it's a diverse committee. It's not that. It's, it's, it's a Ku Klux Klan committee where you're sitting there looking at all white men again trying to make a decision on the African-American community here in Ori County. And we can do better as this, but we have to do better as, as citizens. We have to start this process now for 10 years down the road of what'll happen. Because I'm gonna tell you what I heard even on Thursday night when we meet in a state meeting. Some of them are to the point that the Republicans already drew their maps for this cycle. So we just, we just hit and thin air tonight to come out here in COVID just to be talking among ourselves if it's not gonna affect change. I want a meeting where it's gonna go back to Johnny Gardner and they're gonna do what they're supposed to do and you, even if there's no criteria, it's time that people do the right thing and make some fair districts. We calling for fair district lines, not only here on the local level, and I know you have nothing to do with the state, but I'm gonna make the same case in, on, on next week. With the Senate, uh, the House panel, we ask in Ori County, and you are on the committee, and you are councilman for Seventh District, to go back to the table. And why are you at the table? Is to ask them and to work that we have fair district lines here in Ori County. I know you're using that 300,000, but let me tell you tonight, that 300,000 won't do mean me a bit of good as a black male if y'all cut lines based upon that 300,000. Well, first of all, you made comments about the census numbers were inaccurate. There's different discrepancy. Please provide me your numbers. This is the only numbers we have to work with was provided by the U.S. Census. If you have some numbers, after, the, after this meeting, I will meet with you, and we'll provide those to the committee. Okay? So the committee will follow the Constitution of the United States and the state of South Carolina. We have the, we appointed the committee. In fact, the community is involved in, re, in drawing the lines itself. It, 
that you're a part of that process. We'll be coming out to the communities, provide you the information and the overlays. So we want you engaged, very actively involved in the entire process, okay? And you make comments about what happened in 2010. We've called around and asked if there's lessons learned. Meet with, if you have any lessons learned from 2010, meet with me tonight after the meeting. I will write those comments down and take them back to the committee. And where you like, and when we have the meetings, draw the maps, you would have input at those meetings, okay? Any other questions in regards to that? Yeah, uh, I think we're at uh, questions and answers. Any, we through with the questions and answers? Yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to um, make one statement that um, out of the whole speech um, that was given, I was just quite disturbed about um, the when it comes to drawing the lines that gerrymandering is legal and you know it's basically legal to discriminate, and I just wanted someone, either you or um, the other gentleman, just to clarify um, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act where we're guaranteed protection on the Equal Protection Clause and not to dilute, dilute our votes, um, you know, just like the other gentleman said. And so I just don't want people to be in here confused that y'all can basically go back and draw lines to racially discriminate and there's no well, remedies for that, you know, under the well, law. Well, in Horry County, as I said earlier, you, the numbers we have, 350,000. African Americans represent 13%, okay? That's 45,500 people that live in, or blacks live in Horry County. Okay, now, we were talking about dil diluting the vote, okay? Could you put a map, what's the gentleman's name? Uh, Mr. 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 Bridges? Where's Mr. Bridges? Uh, Braylon, Mr. Please put the map up, Horry County map. And thank you for the questions too. Okay. We will, what we're going to do is advertise in the local newspapers, uh, TV stations. We'll work with uh, different uh, organizations within the community to make sure that information is out, the time and location we have these meetings. And I've been working, or uh, Reverend Mickey James, he's, he's still here? He's, uh, uh, okay, he's, okay, let me finish. Uh, I've been in communication with Reverend uh, Mickey James. As, is Mrs. Anderson here tonight with the Conway branch? Ms. Anderson, raise your hand. We've been in con contact with Ms. Anderson. We'll be going out in the community, going with community organizations, all at the churches, and all media available to get this information out and make sure everyone is at the meeting. You also have the Marion District AME Church, okay. and we're in communication with the uh, uh, the Marion so District AME Church also. Okay, okay, but okay, we're uh, here. Okay, but to answer your question about us, about the numbers, what we will do, as I stated earlier, we'll be out in the community requesting for your input in this decision-making process. Every, you will be a part of that. Uh, again, we will talk with people in the community. If you have information you'd like to share what happened in 2010, we'll make sure we take those corrective action. Okay? That's the way the process works, and we'll make sure that there's no... You have the map? Okay. If you're talking about, for example, how to dilute the vote. In Conway, for example, 
I say if you're 501, if you go in an African American community, you split it in half, that's what we call it. That was dilute the vote, right? Dilute the vote. If you, but I don't see where we've been doing that in Horry County. Is that correct? Like I said, the 2000. Yeah, please, come on up to the map and show me. Come on up here. Like I said, the attempt okay, to do me. that in 2000 okay. ended up in the map being thrown out okay. because it didn't meet the criteria. I would like to address the gentleman what he said about my comments about gerrymandering. I don't want to be misunderstood. Discriminating or gerrymandering because of race is against the law. What's missing is the enforcement provision to do something about it. Now, the other provisions, economic, geographic, political, all of that is perfectly legal. It's never even been proposed to make it illegal. That's kind of goes back to the election of 1828, Andrew Jackson, to the victor belong the spoils. And if you win control of a state legislature, tradition has been you get the right to draw the lines. That's why the elections in 90, in uh, the, the election cycle before a census and the election cycle during the census for state legislatures is so, so important. Okay. Matt, please, sir. Mr. Bridges, okay. When Ulysses, oh, I'm sorry, when Mr. Ulysses Debit was running again for re-election. What year was that? Um, I don't have the year right now, but I, um, help me out. Um, they sorry. moved the district line up here in Juan P. They went right beyond Mr. Ulysses' house and put District 2. And I got family members in Juan P. Went to vote, didn't know they were no longer in District 9. Mr. Ulysses Dewitt could no longer run for District 9 because he was put in District 2. That's what you call gerrymandering, gerrymandering, or whatever you call it. That's what happened. Up here on number 9, come down. And if you look here, District 7, and listen, when he talked about the 300 and some thousand with the census, they draw these lines, but they look like somebody threw paint up there and let it drip down. These are gerrymandered districts up here. You, I'm being specific. I just tell, I'm finna go to seven. Okay. Seven. They came out here on on 501 and went further into near Carolina Forest, Wild Wing area, and then further up 701 South. Although so who was excluded from that then? The African. Show me where the African American was excluded from there. When you got, I'm talking about how they crack. Now we talking about cracking and packing. Cracking mean cracking up the black vote. Packing me, packing in all these white folks in all these other districts trying to make it so it's harder to elect. Look, at, look how this District 11, right down this road here, okay. when you get down past a piece, they took, that's no longer in 7, right down here is in District 11. Your neighbor right down the road is in District 11, but your, your sister next to you could be in District 7. We talking about fair district lines based on where you can draw the people in. Now, and then what they did so what with the... what people was excluded in District 7 then? It's not true. You brought in more whites that diluted the black vote. They claimed based upon the census information. No, well, you got to hit the magic number. I know, know, yeah, yeah, I, I know that. Three, listen three, here, listen. Three, I was in the mapping room in okay. Columbia for the House panel in 2010. Well, we're talking county. And I know you're talking county, but I'm telling you how those maps, down. when they looking at getting the number of people in, Y'all, everybody know that color, and we could have had better looking maps than what we had here. This ain't nothing but gerrymandered here in this county. You can take over here in Brooksville, Little River, all of the Brooksville one and two precincts in this area, you had a chance. You can elect an African American out of this section. But look how that dipped down. You, you could, all of this is number nine you right know here. You people live in Brooksville? 
Well, I don't expect you to see it the way I see it. So, well, I, I, but I'm, I'm but I'm so. telling. I was born here. I was born in 1956. And I'm telling you, you based upon doing doing the doing maps. Well, you have 300, probably about 300 blacks that live in Brooksville. Yeah, you, you have still, another 1,500 live in Poplar. There's still an opportunity with District 9, you can elect the African American if it wasn't gerrymandered. Well, so, explain so, to me, okay, check, okay, explain to me, and I will take it to the committee. Explain to me how you're going to... You expect me to nine. trust your Ku Klux Klan committee. Well, we're not Ku Klux Klan members. That's okay. basically what we're doing. We'll be looking at it. I'm not going to cut okay. no corners okay. tonight because I don't want our people time to be wasted here over some frivolous meeting that don't have any basis with Ori County when it comes to drawing maps. If you can assure us that no. there's going to be fair district maps, then we can come to the well, table and I'll sit there. Show us how to do it then. Okay. If you have the answer, show us how to do it. I'll show you how to do okay, it. Okay, show it. Uh, tonight on here. Yeah, oh, I'm telling you, with District 7, no, you, got district nine, district nine. you got District 9. You got District 7. If okay. y'all come down okay, and come down where? take all of them white folks up here out of this okay. district, Okay. Bring this down, take all the blacks that you took out of District 2, put them back in District 9, you, okay. can, it, you can make it happen. So out of District 9, you want to move more black people into District 9? No, 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 they were taken out of District 9. Put them back in. Okay, put, put them it, back in. Thank you. Okay, you want to put them back in District 9? I'm sorry if I got upset, but I get passionate about this. I get tired of politicians wasting people's time over but frivolous meetings like this, and you bringing us here, but we want change, we want action. And now I'm pointing on here, and I'm trying to help everybody stand, but if you want me to the drawing board, bring me to the meeting, I can show you how to draw it. You telling me on here, but I don't have all the facts or overlays of maps to draw it. I'm basically showing, I told you now, 9, 7, you can almost get another one out, of, out up here. If you take nine and move them back out of there, take the blacks that you took out of number nine and put them back in number nine and, and come back over here and look at all this right here down the road. Most of the black folks in that many on that end down there anyway, but there are a few out there in Oakley Swamp and all. You can bring them um, back into District 7 and do the maps. Okay, but, we're, but ladies, ladies and gentlemen, let me be clear here now. We only have... You know, out of all that, uh, all the districts, put it back up again. We only have 40. Do you mind if, um, since he has to go, do you mind if we hear him and if you need to talk with him afterwards? Yes, ma'am. Okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Okay, ma'am, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Go ahead. Continue. We want to hear him. Okay. I think I'm about finished. <laughs> But no, we just, my thing is, why are we here tonight? We done braved COVID. I want to make sure that all of us coming out here tonight is going to affect change on this Ori County Committee. We tired of our vote being diluted. We tired of not have, having fair representation at the table. Now, Mr. Art ain't going to see it the way I see it because he's a black Republican. So he's not going to see it the way I see it coming down the road. So let's be honest about the whole situation. He don't, he, you, your views and concept the way I see it is a whole lot different. I'm not even really coming from a democratic standpoint. I'm coming from a people standpoint because there's too many people suffering in this county and with these districts. And you know when we look up at that county council, it looks like every time I look up there, I'm going to some hanging chad meeting with, with all these people sitting up there. It's not even fair across the county. Uh, that, that's the point. The map's already, it's done. If you didn't do the census, the work is done, y'all. Okay. That's the point. Ladies, okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's the reason I asked Mr. Uh, Mrs. Spain. Yes, ma'am. What, what, what it happened? It will make a difference because what, what he just stated is that with the numbers in Ori County, with the number of African Americans, you have 45,000, okay? And we're going to make sure that, as he stated, the vote is not diluted. Everybody received under the Constitution of the law. That's what we've been charged to do. And I, my background, I served in the United States military 21 years as an officer in the United States Army, okay? And I took an oath of office to carry out the Constitution of the United States. And I have never failed to do that, okay? And tonight, as we move forward with this committee, you will have input, you have my cell number, you have my email address. At any time, when we draw the maps, you have any question about decisions that we're making, please give me a call.
please be at the meetings and get involved and get engaged. I just wanted to quickly stand up here and say it has nothing to do with redrawing the lines. It's not going to make a difference tonight because we don't have the leadership that we want in office. Half of our black community don't know that once you serve your time and you get out of jail and you're not on probation, you have the right to register again. They can go down there and re-register and somebody will tell them you cannot be registered because you're a convicted felon. That is not true. You, do not, you should not have to, well, if you're on probation, then you can't register to vote. But once you get off of probation and you serve your time, y'all can go back down there and register to vote, get back on there, do what you gotta do. Okay. It's not gonna change until y'all put people in the seat to vote for y'all. Y'all have to, if y'all have someone in y'all community who is a leader, who goes out there, shows up. Half of the time, we only see our leadership when it comes down to election times. I tell everybody this, they don't come in our neighborhood, they don't speak to us, they don't knock on our door. But when it comes down, to re-electing them, they're gonna show their face, they're gonna tell you they're here to do this, they're gonna tell you they're here to do that. Most of the time, that's a lie because they just wanna keep their seat. And it's not only that, and no disrespect to you, but a lot of times, when we do come around to elections, we don't have nobody on the other side to vote for. When you go up there and you go in your precinct, you have one person to vote for. May he be a Republican, nine times out of 10 he is. So that's the only person you could vote for. A lot of people keep their seats because they have no one to run against them. Once we start educating our own culture and other cultures, may it be white or black, because you can have a white person who will do more for you than a black person in that seat would do more for you. It is the person that you vote for. And I think a lot of Republicans and Democrats have it mixed up because they tell you they don't see color. They see color. Don't ever let them tell you they don't see color. Um, so. I just wanted to say it has more to do with us educating ourselves now so that we would be better prepared 10 years down the road, letting people know what the census is and how you fill out the census. Don't look at somebody's color. Look at their background. Um, it don't have nothing to do with the same color sitting in the seat as you. Some of them don't care about us. They care about the money that come in their pocket and the attention that they get. So please don't ever get that twisted. It is about educating ourselves. Once we educate ourselves, we'll be better to speak for ourselves instead of letting people up there speak for us and still not answering the questions we want to answer. Not saying you did that, you did great. Okay, well, to answer your question is that, uh, let just comment, is that what, thank you for, this for one point of clarification, on convi any, anyone in the state of South Carolina with a conviction. Uh, I had the opportunity to serve on the South Carolina probation and pardon parole board for 20 years. I represent the, initially the first congressional district and then when I, last two years on the seventh congressional district. And you're correct. If anyone have a conviction in the state of South Carolina, you, you lose your right to vote. Now, what happens? One, if you're on probation, maximum time you can serve on probation in the state of South Carolina is five years. So if you have a conviction, as soon as you satisfy that sentence, you're eligible to vote. There's no waiting period in the state of South Carolina. Same thing as on parole. If you're in South Carolina Department of Correction, you've been paroled by the state of South Carolina, once you complete the parole sentence, you're eligible to revote. Please, I encourage everyone to go to re register revote. okay? Same thing if you max out. That max out means that you completed your sentence while you're at the South Carolina Department of Correction, so therefore, you have maxed out, you satisfy your sentence, please re-register to vote. Now, anyone have any other questions before we move on to the next topic or a quick second, we close up? Foxford back on county council. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, and I, what I will, uh, as a stage tonight, is that, and closing out the cancel, question and answer is that, we're going to be p publishing a list of locations in all our events, okay? As soon as that information out, I will make every effort to communicate before you before you leave tonight. If we could get into community groups and have point of contacts throughout the county, I guess your email address. We'll email you that information. We'll have constant communication with you. You'll be involved with throughout the process until we take it to council. There's going to be a public hearing at council. We're going to vote on it from there. So please get involved. Get engaged and you're part of that process, and you're, and, I, and thank you for, what, what happens is that a great deal of time is that we do not hold people accountable and responsible for the decision they make, okay? 
and I want you to hold me responsible and accountable for all the decisions I make, okay? Because I've always been trained to do that, and I expect that from my constituents. And I will respond back to you whatever your issue or concern is. Ever since I've been in office, I have done that. Even though we might disagree, uh, you can ask Cedric. Uh, we, we communicate all the time. We don't agree on 100% on everything, no. okay? Probably do about, what, 50? <laughs> sometimes we don't, sometimes we do. But at least I respect him enough to call him, yep. right, Cedric? Yes. And email you and text you. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. All right, then. Anyone, okay? I, I believe in treating everybody the, like I say in the Bible, okay? So if we treat and respect each other, even though we disagree, so that's great, but that's part of being a democracy. And I've been in places like, someone asked a question about voting. I've been in places that where the government would, if you, if you needed an opinion, they would give you one, okay? I've been in those kind of places. I've been deployed in that place. I've been deployed all over the world and uh, working with diverse different type governments. Because, you know, America, we're not, we're not perfect. We're not a perfect country. But it's the only place I would want to live in. Because there's something about, Dr. Bridges to tell you, when he was deployed, he United States Marine Corps retired. When we would fly off to deployments all over the world, when that aircraft landed back in the United States and that tailgate came down, that C-17, Reverend Smith can attest to that, C-17, C-130, 140, 141, C-5A, when that tailgate came down, we walked off the plane. What was the first thing we did? Touch the ground. Why, why do we do that? Why do we do that? All right, then. Okay. But yes, let me move on right quick. So we close out right quick here. Um, next, yeah, is that law enforcement? Yeah, got a question? Let me wrap up right here. Right, I'm going to bring you up in a second. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. I'm going to bring you up in a second. But yeah. next thing is law enforcement recruitment. We talk about diversity and inclusion in Horry County. Uh, we would like to uh, see me right after the meeting tonight. We would like to have more diversified public safety. We have positions available in law enforcement. EMS, we need uh, volunteer, we have volunteer firefighters position, full-time fire positions, E911. Please see me after the meeting tonight. I have that information available for you. COVID-19 testing and vaccination. If you like, your community likes to sponsor uh, COVID-19 testing and vaccination, we have uh, partnered with uh, Care Team Plus and Conway Hospital for that. So see me after the meeting for that, okay? Because it's very important that uh, I'm an advocate for, for uh, vaccination and also wearing the mask. Okay, now, in closing remarks, I'd like to bring up Reverend Rees. I'd like to thank you, Reverend Rees. Come on up, Reverend Rees. And, re and you yes, about the meeting tonight. Uh, we were at, come on up, Reverend Rees, and make the remarks here. Reverend Rees was, uh, was at, attended the Senate uh, committee, redistricting committee. She was at the mic and she stated that the communication that we were lacking in that area is providing information in the community. And through a conversation with uh, Mayor Bellamy, he said, okay, we're going to have one in the community. And we communicated back with Reverend Rees and we responded back to Reverend Rees. I'd like to thank you for that. Do you have your remarks there, Reverend Rees? Yes, sir. We've been sitting at the table this evening, just to be clear. This is where we begin, like, uh, Mr. Fosworth said, chipping at the, at the wall. And so therefore, I thank you all for coming out because some I told it, spread the information out, told, told them about this meeting and you all have showed up. So we are chipping at the wall and we're gonna take it down brick by brick and gonna make it better, not for this generation, my generation, but for our children. That's why we are here. We are here for our children and the next generation and the generation next. So they don't have to come to a meeting to learn about redistricting. They won't have to live in a lawless and under the law of gerrymandering or cracking and packing. That's why we are here. So um, Mr. Bellamy, Councilman Bellamy gave us the opportunity to attend these meetings and I will make sure that the information that he sends out, I'll make sure that I send it out, and once you get it, you make sure you send it out. Um, I am in no way here for any particular party. 
I am here because I am concerned, and most importantly, because I am unlearned. I had no idea what this was. But then I saw how it affected my children and my grandchildren and will affect me too for the next 10 years because I plan to be here <laughs> for a little while longer. So um, please, once you get these emails, if you can't attend, send someone in your community. Thank you. Thank you, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I think it was a great meeting. I'm the president for the Murder Beach branch at the MWCP. Um, come from Murder Beach um, to see what's going on here tonight. Three things I'm concerned about is our education, the one person's here tonight, economics in this area, and also equality. What I don't like to see is what Cedric did and what Mr. Mr. Bellamy did. I don't like to see that. Person gonna speak, let that person speak. Let that person speak. Whoever talk, let that person talk. We don't need no infighting. We got enough for that going on. What we need, I like to sit back. I mean, I agree with you. That's fine. But let let that person say what they're gonna say, and then you go and say what you gotta say, and then we can we can see you know what you like, what you don't like. And so uh, I just want to never see that again out of the uh, of us as a people or uh, anybody. Uh, we need to have a, call, a very organized meeting uh, in this church. Uh, we thank the pastor for this. Was, we're, in, we're in the house of God. And even regardless of that, we're still in a place of uh, wherever you at, you, you, you respect other people. Now, everybody going to agree with you. So uh, if you're on county council, your integrity means a lot. And if you're on any leadership, your integrity means any, everything. People watching what you're saying. So when you try to organize something, they don't want you because they, they see what you're going to do. So everybody going to like you. So the best thing to do is be professional. I'm not trying to tell folk what to do because I'm going to tell you what I would do as a leader. I respect other people. Even though I know you don't like me. That's fine. But I'm still going to say what I got to say. And I ain't going to try to cut you off because I disagree with you. Everybody here tonight was a real good audience. Mary did a wonderful job. All the questions were really good. And I, had, I didn't want to say anything, but I ain't not going to come in Murder Beach as a leader and see this going on and don't say anything. And when I walk out of here, I know I feel, I feel good because I know we all brothers and sisters. I know that. No matter black or white, we all good. I know there's a lot of wrong in Northern County, a lot of wrong in the United States. And we ain't gonna be, we're not going to solve all these problems. But what I want to see us do is learn from Cedric, learn from the pastor of this church, Learn from Mr. Bellamy. Learn from whoever has the answers to what we need to learn. And the people out here know this as much as you know. Some of them know. So let people say what they're going to say, and you get the best out of what they're saying. And then we all walk out and say, man, I learned something from that guy there tonight. I don't know who he is. So when we, we come in these meetings, we can all come in here tonight and say, man, I came from Murder Beach. I came from Ana, wherever I come from, because I learned something from Cedric. I learned something from Mr. Bellamy. And he ain't got all the answers, and I ain't got all the answers, and he ain't got all the answers. Nobody got all the answers, but where can we benefit from this? Things have been done, so I'm wishing in the future that we can reorganize and come back and get educated on all this stuff that we learned tonight. And not only that, get people to vote. Because we can talk all you want to, but when time to go vote, people are not going to the polls and putting their numbers in there, so we're just being useless. That's why you got these, these party lines and all that other stuff gerrymandering going on. Because folk don't even know what gerrymandering mean. They don't know what packing pack mean. And they don't know what cracking mean. And they don't know a lot of things what they mean. So in time to vote, people say, I don't care. Because I don't have nothing to benefit from. So I just want to say that to you tonight. Because the Lord put it in my heart to say that. Because I know we are in a mess. And to be fighting each other ain't going to make it no better than where we are. So we need to come together and sit down and see how can we be a better community and learn from each other so that Orange County can change, and it can change. But it ain't going to change until we change. Because Dr. King once said, the heart can never be totally right if the head is wrong. If your head is wrong, your heart can never be right. So I didn't come to preach to you, but I couldn't say, everybody here not could have been someplace else. But you feel it essential to come to this church Open the doors, Reverend Smith and the pastors here. There should have been more pastors in this church tonight than anybody else in this church. More leaders in this church tonight. Because they're the one that got to sit there with the artists and, and teach them on how they can be developed and learn 
about the Constitution, learn about it uh, from Cedric or anybody else. So I commend the two pastors I see over here. If you're another pastor, I commend you, but I know these two here. So I know that these two here have always been involved, to my knowledge, have been letting people come into their, their church to learn, and so you got to give these guys a hand. Yeah, Dr. McClendon, please stand. Dr. McClendon, please stand. Give her a round of applause, too. You got Dr. McClendon here. Okay. And we have Miss Anderson. Miss Anderson? She's left. Oh, she's left. Okay. Okay. All right. We're. Um, also, since the leader brought it to our attention, I apologize if I over talked you in this meeting. Okay. It's not well, my intention to be rude. Well, I, I was rude okay. or disrespectful, so I do apologize. I was engaged in that myself. I apologize. Uh, we did. Uh, uh, my apologies she, uh, my apology to you. Uh, I heard her talk to you, and that was not the intent. I look forward to uh, working with you in the future uh, so that when we move forward on this, that equality and three things that will happen here, transparency, transparency, and transparency, okay? So at uh, this time, we have Dr. Bridges. Come on up. Dr. Amen. Bridges, give us her closing remarks there, and we'll be going to close out here shortly. Okay. Thank you, um, Councilor Bellamy. And we're not going to uh, retain you or hold you any longer tonight. I, I think a lot has been shared with us tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm for one, I must be honest, that I'm learning as well. Uh, and I've learned this in life. You can't teach what you don't know, and you can't lead what you don't go. <laughs> and so that's where I'm at, and that's why I'm here tonight. And I did uh, learn a little bit more tonight. The pack and the crack and then the brother here talking about a lot, a whole lot tonight. And so, so we will just pray that we can come together and uh, be what the Lord will have us to do. We thank uh, Councilman Bellman as well. Let's give him a hand. Thank you so much, sir, for bringing it to us. Amen. Amen. And Dr. Smith, thank you, sir. Amen. Dr. Smith, man. bless you, sir. Yeah, as, I, as I said earlier, that. We all have different opinions and different point of view. And the intent was to educate you about redistricting, educate you about the committee. We came a long way since 2010. Uh, as I said, we received the emails within 72 hours. We made the correction. Okay? So that shows you that whether you call me Orton Bellamy or you call me black Republican, black this, black that, whatever, at the end of the day, I'm still Orton Bellamy. Okay? And uh, this is not about politics, it's, this is about fairness. And we will ensure that this is equitable and, and we will apply the Constitution and the state law as we go through this process. And any, as I said, we need your help, I need your help to be at the meetings when we draw the lines, okay? I want you to be there at the table. You're a part of this, you're stakeholders. So we would like to see you show up and be a part of it. Uh, we're getting ready, yes ma'am. Miss Miss Owens. Will you have a problem with redistricting? Will you have a problem with Let me explain what happens, okay? We have the redistricting committee, okay? The committee will will make a recommendation. No, what will happen is the committee along with the community. Okay, you're a part of this. The community and the committee. The committee will make a recommendation. From that recommendation, it goes to council. We have three readings. Okay, so that'd be our ordinance. So throughout that process, the community is involved, integral part of it. And then the county, once, the, uh, once we have the, the, the maps have been approved, it goes to council, and we have, we'll have three votes on it. And I vote on it, okay? Even, I'm on the committee, and also I'm a voting member. So you have 12 members to vote on it. I'm, I serve on the ad hoc committee. And we have two African Americans on the ad hoc committee. Okay. And now, and Mr. Um, Cedric made a very valid point here. Tonight, we should be planning for 2030. That's a very valid point. So, as you said about the numbers, so we should be starting tonight educating everyone in the community the importance of um, registering for the census in 2030. So I'll work with you on that and get out of the community. We'll start the process now. That was a very valid point. You stated that, okay? 
that, uh, see, we learn from each other, okay? This is my first time going through this process. I read about redistricting and when I was in college uh, and grad school. Now I have the opportunity to put all those skills to work here and where the rubber meet the road. So, uh, and then we'll carry out this mission, okay? At this time, we'll bring uh, any other comments? Uh, close, get ready to close out. <coughs> depending on what your intent is, depending on what the objective is. If it's to discriminate because of race, that's illegal. If it's to discriminate because of where you live or how you vote, that's legal. Something uh, to follow up just real quick, planning for 2030, uh, West of Conway, sitting as a register of deeds, I'm going to tell you, that is the growth corridor right now, west of Conway. We're building four and 500 unit subdivisions on Brownway Shortcut. I don't know if you all know where that is, but that's way out there. That, so my point is that by 2030, the population is going to be very probably... This census took place during the pandemic, so reporting, as Cedric mentioned, is off, and we probably have a serious undercount. But the numbers we have also do not reflect any of the massive growth we have seen since the lockdown let up and what's going to continue for the next several years. So the numbers you're looking at in, in 2030 are going to probably be drastically different than today. And you really do need to start planning and organizing and figuring out, as someone said, not just what your complexion is, but who's going to stand up for my community. Who knows what it's like uh, to work in the back of a Calabash seafood house or, or whatever the case may be. Whether you're black or white, it doesn't matter. It's, it's who has shared values, shared problems, and shared solutions to those problems. That's what the objective should be. Well, we'll since uh, we have a lot of interest in gerrymandering, but this, this, this type of meeting we will not, because of COVID, the increase in numbers, we'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight, given the uh, circumstances. But what we will do, I will contact uh, a civil rights attorney who specializes in uh, civil rights law and gerrymandering, and we'll uh, get with Edward, okay? And what we'll do, a live telecast on gerrymandering, okay? We'll bring in an attorney who has background in civil rights law, and within the next two to three weeks, and we'll uh, we have a tele 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 live telecast with, um, what's the name of your network is? World Community Magazine, your Monday nights at 7. 7 p.m. So we will get back with you on that because there's a lot of questions about that. What we're here tonight is to do, and a continuation too, is to educate you on any topic. If there's a topic you'd like to have on the website now, because we're going totally virtual because of the numbers are surging now, is that please give me a call and I will uh, reach out to the professionals, like for example, like tonight, uh, Marion Foxworth, a professional in his field. Well, I'll get with the civil rights attorney to come in and do it live, and you can call in and answer, ask a lot of questions. Because what happens is that when you become empowered, when you're educated, when you have in, the intelligence, the information there is available for you, then you have options to sort through all that. Okay, so we will definitely have our next workshop, but it will be virtual uh, on jury matter because there's a lot of questions about that, and, and it's important to to educate everyone on what are the mechanics involved, how to define it. Court cases are either, as, as Cedric said, if you have uh, in here in Ori County. So what we do is to identify, doing the research and identify those areas. And throughout that process, as I said, with the, um, with the committee is that 
we're going to identify the entire area. We'll go through it, and there's, if there's problem areas, we're going to make those corrections as we go through that. And I want you, everyone out here, to hold the committee accountable. That's your job, is to hold us accountable, okay? Everybody agree with that? Yeah. All right, then. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Okay, at this time, we're, we got two more door prizes. Uh, we'd like to, uh, we, I guess you can, we'd like to give away a door prize real quick. Who, uh, the one, who's our senior member tonight? Senior member tonight. We have a gift card for you. Senior member tonight. Again, uh, Bethel, Bethel number one missionary Baptist church here at Dirty Branch. Give it up for Dr. Bridges and the, and the congregation. Uh, we work well together. You know why? Because he's a retired United States Marine, retired United States Army. Whew. All right. We make it happen. <laughs> I got a Marine there too. God, thank you. There. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. But yes, uh, we're going to close out now. We ask uh, for our benediction, Reverend Dorothy K. Reeves. Reverend Reeves, okay. Okay, all right. Dear Angel, dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful and humbled by your presence in our lives this evening. We thank you for the knowledge that we have received, for the wisdom that we have received, and for the understanding that we have came to. We ask right now that you share just your blessings as we leave this place. Okay, this is on. All right, then.